back the clock a hundred years or so in time. Remember those who fought and died our freedom to reclaim. Okay. Firstly, it's an absolute honour for me to be asked to give this speech at the 1916-21 Club 101st um, on the 101st anniversary of the Easter Rising. And the theme I'm going to look at for the speech is 1917 and how it was influenced by 1916 and how it led to events afterwards. And just by way of background, uh, in the British government, Asquith had been replaced by Lloyd George. The World War I was still taking place. There were still thousands of Irish men who had, for whatever reason, joined the British Army. We're on the, on the fields of Flanders, in, on the Somme, being slaughtered in the, in the name of small nations, which Redmond had urged them to do. However, back home in 1917, a lot of the prisoners had been released, and yet we had a situation where the women who had taken over, more or less, after the Easter Rising, were still very much to the fore. And just a couple of events that happened in 1917, um, would just, I just refer to. In, on Liberty Hall on May the 12th, 1917, 100 years ago, next Friday, um, Rosie Hackett, Helena Maloney, Ginny Shanahan and Bridget Davis erected a banner which said, James Connolly murdered May the 12th, 1916. This was put up on the shell of Liberty Hall, which obviously had been severely damaged during the Rising. It was quickly taken down, but Helena Maloney, again, through women's ways of getting things done, had another banner erected within an hour. And 400 police from Store Street Station surrounded the building. And after six hours, they managed to get the banner down. It was watched by thousands of onlookers, but it just again shows that the women were still determined, were still fighting the cause. For example, the bravery of Nurse Elizabeth O'Farrell in taking a white flag, and despite the fact that Pierce knew and she knew that people had been gunned down, the Dillon family, for example, in Moore Street on the Friday evening, notwithstanding the fact that you were carrying a white flag, Nurse Elizabeth O'Farrell still stepped out of number 16 Moore Street and marched to the British barricades at Parnell Street to negotiate the surrender terms. Another feature of the women was obviously the National, the Irish Volunteers Dependent Fund, which, they, which was set up by Sorka McMahon, Anya Kent, and of course, the great Kathleen Clark, to make sure that while the men were in prison, that the families were somehow looked after. They had no separation allowance like the British, the people fighting for the British Army had. They had nothing. And yet, these women raised funds for them, kept families together, kept families alive. So in recognizing the role of the women, I would also like to now look at some of the main events of 1917, which influenced the course of history and right into the War of Independence and the unfortunate Civil War. In early 20, 1917, a by-election took place in Roscommon North, and where Joseph Plunkett's father, George Plunkett of Sinn Féin, beat Tom, Thomas Devine of the Irish Parliamentary Party by 3,000 votes to 1,700. This was Sinn Féin's first major breakthrough. It was a devastating blow for the Parliamentary Party, and it should also be remembered in that election, there were, no women had a vote. The women didn't get the vote until the following year. A few months later, on May the 10th, Joseph McGuinness beat Patrick McKenna by 32 votes. Joseph McGuinness of Sinn Féin, 1,493 votes to 1,461. Interestingly, in Longford South, that was the first election they had had there since 1892. And the reason for that was six British parliamentary elections, which had taken place between 1892 and that by-election, had an unopposed candidate, three times Edward Blake and three times John Phillips. But another interesting feature of that particular by-election was it was the first time Sinn Féin used the slogan, put him in to get him out. In other words, Joseph McGuinness was in jail in England at the time, 
and this became a feature of Sinn Féin by-elections throughout that year and, and afterwards. On May the 16th, six days after that election, Lloyd George announced that he wanted immediate home rule for the 26 counties and leave the six counties to be excluded for another five years. The following month, for once the British made a good decision. They released, under a general amnesty, 120 prisoners, mainly from Lewis Jail. Included in those prisoners was De Valera, Countess Markovic, who had been in Aylesbury, Thomas Ash, and obviously many others. A huge homecoming took place on June the 18th, and the Irish Volunteer Organisation are organising a reenactment of that on June 18th this year. So watch your Facebook page or whatever other social media and we did it last year, it was a very successful. This year is actually the 100th anniversary of those prisoners being released. And the huge homecoming gives me an opportunity just to dispel one of the myths of the revisionists of the Rising, that the prisoners, when they were being brought from the various garrisons, when they had surrendered, that they were abused by the natives of Dublin. Of course that happened in some places, but luckily enough with the advent of the witness statements, we can now see that in the likes of my area in the North Wall, in most of the North Inner City and South Inner City, the prisoners were cheered when they were being put on the boats to Frongoch and to Wales. So that, that did happen. It's there on record now for us all to see. They fought for social justice. They were slaughtered for a crime. The minds and hearts of our patriots Cut down in their prime. Oh, what did they die for? Our nation to proclaim. Murdered by a system that held them in disdain. Now our government commits an act for which they should be shamed. July the 10th. 1917 was another important date. It was the day that De Valera beat Patrick Lynch by 5,010 votes to 2,035 in the East Clare by-election. This would have been a brilliantly organised election campaign and almost modern in its execution insofar as it was probably the first time people were ferried to elect the elections, the polling stations by car and Sinn Féin had organised a, a, a very good campaign. It followed, interestingly enough, the death of Willie Redmond, who was the brother of the Irish Parliamentary Party leader, John Redmond. Willie Redmond was one of five MPs who served in Irish regiments abroad, and he died at the Battle of the Messines in Belgium. July 16th, which was t six days after he was elected, the round room of the Mansion House was crammed to capacity where Sinn Féin demanded a Christian burial for the leaders of the 1916 Rising here. Of course they never got that. The Irish Convention, which was publicly called for by Lloyd George in June 17, was to be composed of representative Irish men from different political parties and views. It was to consist of 101 delegates. But Sinn Féin had five delegates and the All for, the All for Ireland party under William O'Brien had one delegate. Once again, we see how the British misread the Irish situation. The terms of reference of the convention were that Ireland must be within the empire and the supremacy of the British Parliament must be maintained. Sinn Féin, in my view, rightly boycotted and did not attend the Irish convention. The Irish convention subsequently fell apart um, in the following March because of the Western Front uh, situation and then in April 18 um, the Lloyd George government decided to introduce Home Rule and conscription for Ireland and that dual policy of conscription and devolution obviously heralded an end to that political initiative. Going through to August, W.T. Cosgrave who subsequently became um, President of, of the uh, Doyle beat John McGuinness of the Irish Parliamentary Party by 772 votes to 392 votes in Kilkenny in another by-election. And then Jim or Uptaran referred to September 25th, the death of Thomas, Thomas Ash. Thomas Ash, who had been Commandant of the 5th Battalion in 1916 and had 
done Trojan work in North County Dublin and was one of the last to surrender, was force fed by the British and died in the Matter Hospital after being force fed while on hunger strike. A little known, um, or probably little known, comrade of his, Richard Coleman, also took part in the strike, a veteran of the GPO garrison. He died in 1918 and he also had a huge funeral. Of course, Thomas Ashe had been released under the general amnesty in June, 8, in June 17, but he was arrested for sedition on the 20th of September. Went on hunger strike and, as I said, was force-fed. And a, just a quick quote from Collins' eulogy at his graveside in Glasnevin. After the volley of shots were fired, Collins said, nothing additional remains to be said. That volley of shots which we have just heard is the only speech which is proper to be made above the grave of a dead Fenian. Of course, the men here never got that volley of shots or a Christian burial. And for that, we are all, I think, still hurting and sad. October that year, Arthur Griffith was replaced by Eamon de Valera as president of Sinn Féin. Sinn Féin had come to favour achieving separation from Britain by means of an armed uprising, whereas Arthur Griffith, of course, had favoured a peaceful solution and he had based it on a dual monarchy with Britain, which wasn't acceptable, of course. But there were 1,700 delegates in the Mansion House uh, for that particular occasion. And that sort of brings us to the end of 1917 and a lot of things still to commemorate and celebrate this year and the 1916-21 club will play its role very actively in that and in saying that I have to acknowledge and Jim always acknowledges my role but he and the 1916-21 club have no idea of the influence the respect and the regard in which they're held because when the application to have the Tom Clark the East Link Bridge renamed the Tom Clark Bridge Yes, I was able to do the paperwork and bring, bring an application, but the endorsement of the 1916-21 club was the key factor in ensuring that that was accepted. And it was unanimously accepted by every councillor in Dublin City Council. And furthermore, there's four million euros of capital funding to be spent on making the bridge a fitting and iconic tribute to Tom Clark. I'd also like to thank the people of Ireland for the celebrations and in the way the silent majority came out last year and said, yes, we are proud of what happened in 1916. Yes, we will celebrate it. And yes, we will do it our way. We will do it from the ground up, not from government down with dictation. And everywhere, including this area, there was massive celebrations, projects, local history projects, books written, etc. And that was for someone who firmly believes in the Republican cause and in the United Ireland and the sacrifice that was made by the men and women of 1916. It was a great, I was really pleased to see how that went. Could the vision of the men of 1916 become a reality? Does Brexit give us an opportunity of seeing a United Ireland in our time? Maybe and maybe not. Maybe we should have a border poll, maybe not. If we have to reach out to the unionists how can we do so to, to earn their trust and respect to ensure that a republic in the wolf tone meaning of the word comes about? Does the current rise in the liberal agenda act as a barrier to that unification? Unfortunately, some of those pushing this agenda while insisting on secularism do not seem to regard tolerance, respect for an alternative view or the very notion of pluralism as acceptable or indeed allowable. As we stand here today and honour the men and women of 1916, we owe it to them to ensure that their vision becomes a reality in a peaceful and in an inclusive way. And I'll just finish by recite, reading from Liam McInchin's poem, We Saw a Vision. The poem captures the spirit of the 1916 leaders, as well as the vision of those who fought for Irish freedom in 1798, 1803, 1848, 1867, the 150th anniversary of this year of the Fenian Rising, and 1916. I'd like to finish by reading that poem. We saw a vision. In the darkness of despair, we saw a vision. We lit the light of hope. 
and it was not extinguished. In the desert of discouragement, we saw a vision. We planted the tree of valor, and it blossomed. In the winter of bondage, we saw a vision. We melted the snow of lethargy, and the river of resurrection flowed from it. We sent our vision a swim like a swan on the river. The vision became a reality. Winter became summer. Bondage became freedom. And this we left to you as your inheritance. A gloom to Nasertia, Kribnika Yuringa, gloom to Nahashlinga. O generation of freedom, remember us, the generation of the vision. Or a male of Mahagwev Galer.